Listo, David. Sí, pues si quieres presenta el seminario, Omar, y luego presento a John. Hola, ¿qué tal? Buenas, buenos, buenas tardes ya aquí en la Ciudad de México. Eh, bueno, esta es la primera sesión de este seminario que hemos estado ya organizando desde hace ya, de casi más de un año y medio eh, en este esfuerzo que hemos coordinado eh, a través de la Universidad Autónoma de Coahuila, la Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México, eh, a través del posgrado de la Facultad de Economía y su especialización en Historia Económica. Eh, y bueno, pues estamos muy contentos porque se suma además la Universidad Autónoma de Baja California. Eh, y bueno, tenemos ya un programa ¿no? eh, para esta primera mitad de año y estamos muy contentos de tener eh, en esta ocasión y abrir nuestras sesiones de esta primera mitad del año con el doctor John Weaver, John Weaver que eh, nos va a presentar una... una uh, nos va, nos va a presentar un trabajo ¿no? que está relacionado con una publicación ¿no? eh, que se titula eh, From South Texas to the Nation, The Exploitation of Mexican Labor in the 20th Century. Entonces, bueno, pues sin mayor preámbulo, le doy la bienvenida al doctor. Eh, y bueno, pues, esperamos que no sea la última la primera y la última vez que nos veamos por acá. Eh, muchas gracias y, y bueno, los dejo. Eh, la sesión la va a moderar el doctor David Adán Vázquez. Entonces, eh, pues un, un gusto tenerlos por aquí. Gracias. Bueno, bueno yo, yo, voy, yo voy a presentar al doctor Weber. Voy a leer eh, rápidamente su, eh, su currículum. Me estaba diciendo que no está completo en la página. Yo olvidé eh, pedirle una versión más, más amplia. Eh, a él ha sido muy amable, la verdad es que estamos muy contentos de que esté por acá porque ha sido muy amable y muy gustoso eh, en platicar con nosotros, eh, aparte de que su trabajo pues, es, es muy muy bueno. ¿no? Entonces, eh, brevemente les digo que el doctor Weber eh, pues, eh, hizo su, su licenciatura, su bachelor's en la Universidad de Vanderbilt, su, master's en, su maestría en, la universidad, en el colegio de William Mary y eh, su doctorado también lo hizo ahí. El doctor Weber es profesor asociado en el Departamento de, de Historia de la Universidad Old Dominion en Virginia y recibió su doctorado en 2008. Eh, y entre, sus recono entre los reconocimientos que ha tenido, ha tenido varios reconocimientos, ha ganado el premio eh, George Posera eh, sobre eh, historia de la sociedad eh, de, histórica sobre inmigración y estudios étnicos. Eh, ha ganado la beca John Jenkins y su libro, este libro del cual nos va a compartir eh, algunas de sus, de sus eh, líneas eh, de investigación y de los resultados a los que llegó, fue finalista en el premio Weber Clemens eh, de en la eh, Asociación de Historia del Oeste de los Estados Unidos. Entonces, eh, sin más preámbulo, le voy a dar eh, la palabra al doctor John Weber. John, it is a great pleasure for us to, be, uh, to have you here. We really, really appreciate the opportunity to uh, speak with you, and uh, thank you for being here. And uh, without further ado, I will leave you the floor. So. Okay, great. Um, thank you. Uh, and I wanted to start by, uh, I've sort of told David this a couple of times. Um, I apologize. I, I, I'm not proud of the fact that I, I, I don't feel like I'd sort of do this completely in Spanish. I, I would like to. Um, so I apologize. I'm not trying to sort of be disrespectful by um, sort of presenting this in English. That's just my own. Um, limitation that, again, I'm, I'm not at all proud of. Um, also, again, thank you for um, both inviting me to sort of talk to your group. I'm, I'm really sort of excited to kind of um, speak to you all about this stuff and for those of you um, for attending. Um, so my goal for today is to try and discuss the broad context for my book, um, the primary arguments that I make in that book, and what I see as the most important historiographic interventions, um, and then really to zero in on the subjects covered in chapter three, Breaking the Machines, Building the Color Line, and Immobilizing Mobile Labor um, in Chapter 7, the Bracero Program and the Nationalization of South Texas Labor Relations, which I believe have been sort of distributed. Um, my training um, in graduate school was in labor and migration history, uh, and that's really the way I kind of approached this book's subject matter. Uh, how did a distinct form of labor relations develop in South Texas in the early 20th century, and how were issues of migration and mobility key in creating uh, 
solidifying and ultimately spreading that system to really the rest of the United States. Uh, my first major argument, um, and it's not at all an original one, but it's one that I think uh, deals directly with what I, I, I you know, with, with the sort of subject matter of, of this seminar. Um, and it's one that I, I is trying to kind of break through the often kind of parochial view that most people in the United States have of the history of this country, which is that we stand outside the history of the entire rest of the world, right? What happens everywhere else doesn't really matter. Um, so one of my key kind of arguments here, and again, this is not an original one, um, is that the development of South Texas was intimately linked to the economic and demographic development of Northern Mexico during, in particular, the Porfiriato. So capitalist development that drew South Texas more completely into the global market came from both the North and the South. Commercial and railroad links to Monterrey, Tampico, Torreón, and Mexico City were just as important as links to Houston, New Orleans, Los Angeles, and New York in building up this region. The rail networks that met at the Texas-Mexico border starting in the 1880s brought capital and they brought people. While the labor migration waves of the pre-revolutionary decades pale in comparison to what happens after 1910, they set some of the groundwork for the enormous changes that are fueled by two distinct migration waves in the years after 1910. Um, the larger one moving north out of Mexico, in particular during the years of the revolution, um, the other one moving south from the US Southeast and Midwest in search of economic opportunity in what were the newly developing agricultural regions of South Texas. Uh, the second major argument I make in this book is that efforts to control mobility were key to the development of South Texas and to the model of labor relations which developed there. The clearest way for me to sum this up um, is to read a few pages from the introduction. Um, and if you'll sort of bear with me here, I've decided that I'm much better at reading my own argument than trying to restate it um, off the top of my head. So I'm gonna read a, a couple of pages here um, John, to kind of get at that. That, that is okay. If you want me to, if you want me to translate the, one of the chunks that you consider important, you just let me know. Okay. Most of the um, people here do understand English, but um, but if you try to, if you want to emphasize anything, just let me know. Okay. Uh, okay. And again, if if it would be helpful for anyone, please just let me know. I'm happy to stop and 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 sort of do that again. I I the last thing I want to be is the asshole American here, <laughs> refusing no. to do anything that's not in English. Um, no, that's okay. So. <laughs> <laughs> with, with that as my starting point. Uh, employed by Anglo farmers, Mexicans and Mexican Americans found themselves relegated to the bottom of this emerging order, welcomed across the international boundary to be exploited for their labor, but excluded politically and socially. What emerged was a social, political, and economic arrangement built on a cross border caste system. This, newly, this new society emerged fully formed in the early decades of the 20th century. Newcomer farm interests, eager to sweep away all vestiges of the ranching society that previously dominated the region, set about uprooting the older systems of politics, landholding, and ethnic accommodation. In its place, they created a strictly segregated world that sought to preclude Mexican American autonomy and entry into the realm of Anglo political and economic elites. Mexican American citizenship rights became abstractions to be ignored whenever necessary. Just as important and certainly related to the calculated disregard of any rights enjoyed by non-Anglos was the focus of farming interests on maintaining control of mobility within their society. The multifaceted effort to achieve this control proved central to the South Texas model of labor relations. On the one hand, mobile workers built the new farm society. Growers had no interest in recreating the static land tenure patterns of the Southeast, um, preferring temporary wage labor to sharecropping and tenancy. Workers constantly on the move, both in Texas and entering Texas from Mexico, provided farmers with necessary labor power without the reciprocal bonds that characterize older agricultural labor patterns. On the other hand, growers came to fear the mobility of their labor supply. While they preferred the freedom from responsibility during non-harvest times, that came with migrant farm workers. They worried that workers capable of moving when and where they wanted might abandon the fields of South Texas or use their mobility as a negotiating tool. This seemingly ambiguous desire for both mobility and immobility of the workforce shaped much of South Texas farm society. And in many ways, mobility and immobility acted as two sides of the same coin. A mobile farm worker was certainly welcome to farmers at the beginning of harvest season, though they expected this worker to remain for as long as needed and then leave when the work was done. The politics of mobility in South Texas determinations of who and what could cross internal 
and external boundaries, whether legally determined or arbitrarily imposed by force, emerged from the political takeover by farm interests and reflected their desire to shape the society to their needs. Their efforts to control mobility both mirrored and strengthened their construction of this caste-like social system. South Texas was certainly not alone um, in creating an exploitative agricultural system. Uh, there's elements of this that echo to the cotton belt of the Southeast, right? Places where slavery had existed and been central and are then replaced by different um, but related forms of racialized control. Um, there's also, again, a long tradition in particular in places like, right, Northwestern Mexico, Northeastern Mexico, California, um, to the kind of the, the immediate um, kind of US case of using migrant labor, right? California had a long history of cycling through various different racial and ethnic groups um, for its labor supply. Um, but I would argue that what happens in South Texas is these things become combined. Um, practices often associated with the Southeast and West Southwest create a potent form of labor relations built on mobile workers stripped of their rights. Unquestioned political control and continued migration from Mexico made these practices possible and helped launch an agricultural boom built on low wages during the 19-teens and 1920s. This system became even more important in the following decades, as at every turn, the power of the state fell in behind employers. The exclusion of agricultural workers from labor protective legislation, the politics of immigration restriction that continually weakened the ability of Mexicans and Mexican Americans to claim rights, and the federal government's continued accession to demands for temporary foreign labor, all strengthened agricultural employers' grip over their workers. Um, I promise I'm going to be done with this reading through this in a minute. Um, these developments have also affected the nation as a whole. The lessons learned by the growers of South, South Texas were not isolated to the border region. Employers elsewhere looked to draw out the labor pool and replicate the labor practices of South Texas. The effects of these practices migrated across the country just as Mexican and Mexican American farm workers did in the decades after the Mexican Revolution. Rather than a social and political backwater, South Texas became an important model for agricultural interests throughout the nation. The migrant labor stream based in South Texas expanded as Mexicans and Mexican Americans sought better opportunities, which helped recreate the racially segmented workforce on farms far removed from the border. Ethnic Mexicans, regardless of their country of birth, were consistently depicted and treated as an alien presence within the United States that lacked the ability to join the dominant society. Their resulting lack of citizenship rights recommended them to employers across the nation. The workers who moved through South Texas represented the ideal labor supply for agriculturalists. Highly mobile and available for seasonal employment, they were often stripped of basic rights because of their racially subordinate position and inability to exercise the privileges of citizenship. As such, the importance of the development of the South Texas model of labor relations extended beyond the fields of the Southwest. As the farms of South Texas continued to grow, they relied more and more on labor from Mexico. The growers in the rest of the United States followed suit and increasingly drew their labor from Mexico and other foreign sources as a means to ensure a surplus labor supply and low wages. In the race to the bottom among farming interests, the growers of South Texas led the way. The farm society that developed has obviously not been the only example of a low wage labor system, but one important strand of contemporary low wage labor relations can be traced back to the practices developed in the fields and towns of South Texas. Um, and I, I suppose I should pause here and may, I, I am kind of making an argument here more about the United States than I am more broadly, um, the US economy and US sort of labor relations. Obviously there's low wage labor regimes all over the world that differ in important respects from what I'm talking about. Um, it is important to remember that the system did not harken back to older forms of labor relations. South Texas growers devised a thoroughly modern set of practices that relied on forced mobility, enforced immobility, and an activist state not present in earlier times. Their modernity, then, not their backwardness, is what makes these labor practices important. Um, and in some ways, right, I'm sort of trying to make a couple of different historiographic arguments here. One of them is I'm trying to put South Texas agricultural workers more centrally into the way that we talk about the history of labor in the United States, 
um, which has often been right fixated for obvious reasons on industrial workers, right on on steel workers, on car workers, on people in um, you know Detroit, um, Chicago, right urban areas. Um, and I'm arguing that you know there's an enormous amount um, to say about the current reality of labor relations in the United States and more broadly in looking at agriculture and looking at migrant labor and in looking particularly at what happens in South Texas. Um, so even if South Texas is right, quite literally geographically peripheral to the country, the practices there were not, right? I, I argue that they were enormously important in setting up what is essentially um, a broader sort of stream of, of kind of low wage labor relations that continues to grow in importance in this country. Um, part one of the book, uh, focuses on the way, so chapters one and two, South Texas shifted from an isolated ranching society to a booming agricultural region built on this mobile labor. Uh, that mobile labor force rapidly expanded out from the border region, seeking more opportunities and higher wages, but migrant workers also moved out of necessity as low wages in agriculture made their annual cycles through citrus, onion, spinach, cotton, and sugar beet harvest, right? Just to take a series of examples that would have been a fairly typical cycle um, for individual kind of migrant workers from the teens really through the 1960s um, as the only way to really feed themselves. Uh, but again, as I sort of said, from the point of view of growers, this was simultaneously what they built their agricultural society on, but also one that was inherently unstable, right? Because again, mobility brings both the opportunity to leave, the opportunity theoretically to bargain, um, but it also, right, having that sort of rootlessness um, creates kind of ways in which um, exploitation can be um, uh, secured more firmly on the workforce. Um, part two of the book, right, chapters three and four, uh, is really where I kind of focus here. Chapter three um, is much more on the ways in which they tried to immobilize those work that workforce. Chapter four deals with immigration controls and the way that that in many ways supplemented um, the efforts to immobilize. Um, but before I focus on the ways in which Texas growers sought to immobilize and control migrant labor, I first wanna talk a little, about, a little bit about the importance of violence in this history. Um, again, on the one side, one of the key elements in this history is the violence of the Mexican revolution, right? So many of the things I'm sort of talking about here are kind of rapidly accelerated by the enormous kind of demographic um, uh, push factors that are created during the revolution, right? Again, the numbers are, are kind of hazy, but you know most estimates have it at more than a million people um, leave Mexico for the United States during um, you know 1910 to 1920, um, roughly speaking. And again, those numbers are always going to be impossible to really kind of verify, but you know regardless of what these specific numbers are, it's an enormous demographic shift. Right, much of it in those early years coming from northeastern Mexico, though, you know, as the revolution evolves and as um, fighting breaks out in other areas, you also see right western Mexico being a big sending area, all of those sorts of things. Um, just as important and in many ways longer lasting in the specific kind of reality of South Texas uh, is the racial violence that sat at the heart of the agricultural society that was built there. The racial violence that pervaded the region was sometimes expressed as the implicit threatened violence that defines systems of racial segregation, uh, but often devolved into direct physical attacks. The most extreme example of that um, is the aftermath of the discovery of the plan of San Diego, uh, an, iridescent, an iridentist, excuse me, <laughs> plan to start a race war in Texas um, to break Texas and the U.S. Southwest away from the United States. Um, I, I, I don't I, you know, there have been a few books written about this, some of them quite good, James Sandoz's book, um, ben Johnson's book, there have been a few other books recently um, that are quite bad that I would not at all recommend anyone reading. But again, this is a sort of moment of uh, cataclysmic violence as the discovery of this plan and a few raids against law enforcement, railroad and um, telegraph um, facilities in South Texas leads to a massive um, overwhelming wave of uh, backlash violence led by vigilantes and by law enforcement, uh, most notoriously with the Texas Rangers um, sweeping into the lower Rio Grande Valley of South Texas and leading what for all intents and purposes in the summer of 1915 was a race war. Um, anyone non-Anglo found out on the 
found outside was more than likely to be killed. Um, again, the death tolls for this are hard to say, but most conservative estimates put it in, in the high hundreds. Um, some estimates go as, five, as far as 5,000 people um, killed again in a couple of months in the summer of 1915 in South Texas. Uh, the violence was fueled by racial hatred, the opportunity to steal land from Mexican-American landowners, and a fervent desire to sweep away any vestiges of a system that still provided room for Mexican-American political and economic power. The memory of the racial violence of 1915 remained potent in South Texas for decades for both the perpetrators and the targets of that violence. The system that emerged after 1915 was built on the implied threat of racial violence that always animates white supremacist political and economic systems. Um, and again, I, I don't think I'm sort of saying anything controversial here. This entire society was built on, at a very most basic way, a kind of white supremacist economic and political system, right? That was the purpose of this system that was sort of put in place in the 19 teens um, and then sort of expands from there. Um, so chapter three, uh, breaking the machines, building the color line and immobilizing mobile labor explains the ways in which growers and their allies sought to immobilize their mobile labor. There were overlapping efforts that took place during the 19 teens, and 1920s. Um, the first part of this campaign though really um, is largely achieved during the 19 teens. And that was the campaign to eliminate Mexican-American voting rights. Through a combination of Jim Crow tactics like the white primary and law enforcement intimidation at the polls, the state of Texas and local officials uh, worked to eliminate the electoral power of, Mex of the Mexican-American majority in South Texas. Uh, probably the most infamous example of this was the effort to scare Mexican-Americans away from voting that occurred in 1918, um, when during a kind of an important sort of uh, gubernatorial election, the Texas Rangers were fanned out all over the southern part of the state, basically just as an intimidation factor, right, to keep Mexicans and Mexican-Americans from voting um, with the sort of implicit violence that the Texas Rangers had a very well-earned reputation for. Um, the farming elite then used their political control to expand the grip of segregation to every aspect of South Texas society. The efforts to restrict the mobility of their workforce unfolded then out of the control that farming elites now held over the state and local government and the hand they now had from the state and local law enforcement. Growers wanted to maintain an overflowing local labor pool that guaranteed low wages while not having to live up to the reciprocal requirements of a more static labor system, right? Something like tenancy um, or frankly, even peonage, right? As, as, as sort of, uh, as much as peonage is a system of bounded labor, there's at least some notion of, of reciprocity there. Um, what they wanted here was temporary peonage that could be ex ended at the moment the farmer no longer needed that labor there. Um, geographer Don Mitchell uh, has referred to this as, quote, the history on one side of finding ways to control the movement of labor and on the others of finding the means to make that mobility subversive. Uh, some of these efforts were incredibly rudimentary, right? Locking workers in their, um, you know, cabins at night, threatening them with violence, right? The, the overseer standing outside the housing with a shotgun, um, stealing their shoes while they slept. There were a bunch of farmers in South Texas who did this, right? That if, we, if they don't have their shoes, they won't run away during the night. Keeping husbands and wives separated so they cannot leave together. Um, again, these are incredibly rudimentary, but they were, you know, part of this system. But even at their most basic, these methods of inhibiting the mobility of workers were made possible by the endorsement of these measurements by law enforcement, sometimes tacitly, sometimes loudly and in lockstep. Um, probably the best example of that is one that uh, I believe I saw that David Montahano had sort of spoken um, with you. Um, and he talks about one of these in his um, book, uh, Angles and Mexicans in the Making of Texas, um, what come to be known as the Raymondville peonage cases. Um, which is the law enforcement establishment in Raymondville, which is in Willisee County, just one county north um, of the border um, in the lower Rio Grande Valley, basically had a system where anyone leaving Willisee County during harvest season would be arrested um, for vagrancy and sold to the local farmers to do work, to do unpaid labor. Um, and, you know, for a few years, this continued. 
Um, so again, this is one of those moments where we see very clearly, right? Local law enforcement is entirely bought and sold by the growers who are eager to, you know, use whatever means they can to force workers to immobilize during the moments when they are most needed. Uh, the culmination of these efforts uh, came with the passage of what's known as the Immigrant Labor Agency Law of 1929. This was passed in the state of Texas. Uh, it required any contractor hoping to send workers outside of Texas to pur purchase a $7,500 occupation tax. Uh, according to my quick internet search, that is now more than $120,000. Um, so this is a, an egregious um, cost for anyone wanting to send workers outside of the state of Texas. And the point was to criminalize um, contracting of workers, sending them outside of the state. Um, the state of Texas was never able to fully enforce this law, um, but that was really never the point. The point was they passed it. Um, and in the words of David Montajano, um, quote, this political situation for Mexicans in Texas appeared quite ominous. With 85% of the state's migratory labor force composed of Mexicans, the thrust of these labor laws was unequivocally clear. They were, in essence, a set of racial labor controls. I mean, again, this is one of those moments where you have direct analogs to the Jim Crow South. Um, Anti-enticement laws were a kind of constant feature of the cotton belt um, from the late 19th century, in particular in the early 20th century, as you have large numbers of African-Americans seeking to migrate out of the South. Anti-enticement laws was one of the ways they found of trying to stop that migration, right? So the same thing's happening in South Texas at this moment. Um, this form of labor relations, in other words, combined a racially segmented job market with a clear denial of the basic rights of choice and mobility, particularly for Mexicans and Mexican-Americans. Um, what ended up actually breaking up the Raymondville peonage um, system was that a few Anglos got caught up in the system. They complained to law enforcement elsewhere, and so the state ends up stepping in and breaking it up. Um, nobody cared until a couple of Anglos get involved. Um, so again, that is itself a kind of clear sort of signal of, of the way in which kind of race um, worked in here. Uh, but I also want to highlight an important part of the system that's the focus of chapter four. Um, the chapter, the, the title of that, and I know you guys didn't read it, I just want to sort of quickly go through this, uh, is Homing Pigeons, Cheap Labor, and Frustrated Nativists, uh, Immigration Reform and Deportation. Uh, the growth of this infrastructure of border control in the early 20th century supplemented and reinforced the racialized system of mobility controls that developed in South Texas. As scared as South Texas growers were that their labor pool would shrink as workers went north for better pay, they were just as terrified that their access to labor south of the Rio Grande could be cut off by the growth of nativism and immigration restrictionism nationally. I don't want to spend too much time on this because it's not one of the distributed chapters, uh, but the ways in which border enforcement involved, evolved, excuse me, in the years between 1910 and 1930, right? So the exact years that this sort of form of labor relations is being constructed had a profound effect, I argue, on the legal standing of Mexicans and Mexican-Americans in the United States. Most nativist demands for immigration restriction nationally targeted other groups, right? Starting with anti-Chinese sentiment in the late 19th century, um, shifting then to essentially all of Asia by the early 20th century, um, but beyond that, U.S. immigration restriction was, was fairly kind of ad hoc until we get to the kind of World War I era, right? So Chinese couldn't come in, um, then eventually all of Asia. Um, eventually, there's sort of targeting of Southern Europeans. Um, there's targeting of Eastern Europeans. Um, there's also regulations against anyone who's diseased, um, political radicals, prostitutes, right, et cetera, et cetera. But in a lot of ways, these were very kind of random unfocused targets, um, that starts to change in the teens when the political power of these nativists allowed them to pass important changes in U.S. immigration law that restricted who could enter the United States in a more systematic way. The Immigration Act of 1917 had a head tax and a literacy test for entry. Uh, the Immigration Act of 1921 added a quota for every country outside of the Western Hemisphere. Uh, that quota then shrank and became more targeted in the Immigration Act of 1924. Um, in all of these laws, Western Hemisphere migrants were excluded from the quotas. But the growth of the infrastructure of restriction, just as the focus of many nativists turned to the southern border as a whole that they argued needed patching, 
led to greater scrutiny on migration across the US-Mexico border. This attention then picks up um, an enormous amount throughout the 1920s as nativists sought to put Mexico under quota restrictions while agricultural interests sought to stop those restrictions. Um, I, I know, um, uh, I'm forgetting his, I'm blanking on his first name, um, Alanis Enciso uh, has written about this recently. He just put out an essay on the, the Fox Law um, in Historia Mexicano, I believe. It's Fernando Saul. Thank you, that's, that's exactly, I, I apologize. I completely blanked on his first name there. Um, there are these sort of debates um, that largely center around, again, whether there's going to be a, a quota sort of added, right? So a numerical restriction on how many can come in. Um, the remarkable part about those debates is both sides, the restrictionists led by John Box, who was a Texas Congressman and, and genuinely kind of ridiculous human being, um, and the anti-restrictionists who are almost entirely agricultural interests. They both shared the exact same racist assumptions about Mexican migrants, even as they made opposing arguments. Um, they both essentially argued, again, they were both sort of suffused with kind of eugenicist arguments about notions of racial hierarchy um, that, you know, right, conveniently for them, placed them at the top of that racial hierarchy and everyone else um, in gradations below them, right? They both made, both sides made astonishingly racist arguments about who Mexicans were and whether that they should be allowed in. The restrictionists argued they would come in and degrade the racial stock in the language of the 1920s of the United States. The other side essentially argued that Mexicans um, would inherently remain separate from US society, that they had no interest in assimilation, they had no interest in coming in and becoming a part of the United States. Um, and part of the title of this chapter, um, one of the arguments that was very seriously made by US agricultural interests was that Mexicans inherently had a homing instinct. They were like pigeons. They would come to the United States, they would work for a while, and then they would inherently be drawn back. Um, one of the loudest voices making this argument was John Garner, who was a longtime congressman from South Texas, who eventually became vice president under Franklin Roosevelt. Um, and he was one of the loudest voices um, against these restrictions. Um, the remarkable thing about these debates um, is how those were the only sides that were presented. Um, nobody in the US government ever actually listened to the Mexican or Mexican American arguments here, right? There were efforts to um, already by this point, um, right? You've got Mexican American sort of um, civil rights groups. Uh, you've got uh, Manuel, uh, right? Manuel Gabio's work was already sort of well known here. Um, you've got others, you know, who are, are trying to kind of speak on behalf of the Mexican and Mexican American populations, but none of that makes it into these debates. These debates are entirely about um, the racial suitability of, of, of the people of Mexico um, and whether or not they should be allowed into the United States. Um, those debates, and again, the astonishing sort of racist understandings that sat at the heart of them, coincided with the birth and growth of the border patrol within the immigration service. For nativists and for the often cash-strapped immigration service, there was political benefit in depicting Mexican, Mexicans as the prototypical undocumented migrants. One group, the immigration service, or excuse me, one group, the nativists, sought a racialized scapegoat to exclude, while the other, the immigration service, needed to produce some proof that it was capable of securing the border. In the years leading to the beginning of the Great Depression, then, politically powerful nativists turned their attention more and more to the US-Mexico border and the effects of that were profound. And again, I wanna very quickly read um, my kind of concluding paragraphs on that sort of chapter four about um, the longer term kind of impacts of these things. Um, both Mexicans and Mexican Americans found that their ability to claim rights steadily diminished as a result of these changes in immigration law. While these laws and regulations obviously applied more directly to citizens of Mexico to this, than to citizens of the United States, both groups felt their effects. Mexicans and Mexican-Americans often viewed themselves as distinct groups with distinct interests rather than as a monolithic group brought together by, by notions of common race or ethnicity. For policymakers, employers, restrictionists, and others viewing the Mexican origin population from afar, 
However, the notion that Mexican identity defined people as a race erased those distinctions. With each successive restrictionist action, whether a new law or a deportation campaign, the difference between Mexicans and Mexican-Americans blurred for those who viewed them as a racially and culturally distinct population. As May Nye has argued, the effects of this regime of restriction, which increasingly cast Mexicans as the primary violators of US immigration law, was to make Mexican-Americans alien citizens in her term. People, quote, born in the United States with formal US citizenship, but who remained alien in the eyes of the nation. In other words, at the beginning of the Great Depression, the balance of power in South Texas had shifted even further towards the growers. Their efforts to construct a system of absolute mobility controls bent to their economic needs had failed, but it was an auspicious failure. They may have lacked the power to determine when and where their workers moved, and they could not completely push aside the nativist campaigns to restrict Mexican entry into the United States, but their workforce now enjoyed even fewer legal protections than before. Uh, in the fight over the politics of mobility in South Texas, defeats often became victories. Um, so uh, I sort of follow that. The next kind of part of the book, the next two chapters deals with the Great Depression. Um, and I really like those chapters. I think there's a lot of really sort of interesting things with the way that the kind of um, the state shifts its sort of operations during the Great Depression, uh, sometimes in positive ways, sometimes not. Um, there's also obviously the enormous sort of um, reality of deportation campaigns in the early depression years that, that shape a lot of this. Um, there's also, again, an enormous number of examples during depression of, of Mexicans and Mexican Americans fighting back. A huge labor organization pushes all of these sorts of things. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and jump ahead to the last chapter on the Bracero program because um, that's what you guys have been straight in. So um, I, I, I'm happy to sort of talk about the Great Depression stuff, but we'll, we'll go ahead and jump forward. Um, so I, I'm not going to go into a great deal of time, a great deal of detail um, explaining what the Bracero program is. I, I'm going to assume um, some sort of understanding of that. Obviously, right, it emerges from an effort by the U.S. and Mexico to create this binational contract labor scheme in the midst of supposed labor shortages in the United States. Uh, but I want to focus here on the ways in which Texas growers and political elites helped shape the program. At its most basic level. The Bracero program was an effort by agricultural interests in the United States to replicate the surplus labor pool of South Texas all over the country, with, it's worth noting, the help and explicit approval of both governments. Texas growers, for their part, made it very clear from the beginning they had no interest in allowing either government to dictate their labor practices and whined incessantly throughout the life of the Bracero program that it stripped them of their rights. But throughout the program's more than two decades of existence, Texas growers and politicians remained central to its evolution. Um, now, again, I'm saying this in spite of the fact that Texas was obviously locked out of the Bracero program for its first five years, as Mexico unilaterally blacklisted the state for its very long history of anti-Mexican discrimination and violence. Uh, during that five-year period, Texas growers responded by recruiting workers as they always, always had, largely unconcerned with the official rebuke of the blacklist. Um, there are a couple of exceptions um, that are fairly notorious for how pointless they are. Um, shortly after Texas is blacklisted, the state of Texas passes um, what's known as the Caucasian Race Resolution, um, which says that um, the state of Texas does not approve of any uh, discrimination against anyone of the Caucasian race. Uh, Mexicans legally are Caucasian, therefore, what this was saying is the state of Texas resolves that we don't like anti-Mexican racism. Um, the governor of Texas sends this to the Mexican foreign minister, and the Mexican foreign minister essentially says, right, rightly, that's cute, but this isn't going to change our mind, right? You passing a resolution does nothing to deal with the chronic history of anti-Mexican violence in your state. Um, they next took a slightly bigger effort to create what was known as the Good Neighbor Commission. Uh, and this was meant to be an investigative body run by the state of Texas that would look into and try to solve instances of anti-Mexican racism and violence throughout the state. Um, again, theoretically, this is not a bad thing. Uh, in practice, the Good Neighbor Commission was 
no more effectual than the Caucasian resolution had been. It was a state effort to paper over racism, right? To hide racism where it very clearly existed, to pretend it didn't happen, um, and to hope that Mexico would be tricked into thinking they were actually doing something. Um, I could go into way more detail with the Good Neighbor Commission, but I'm going to sort of move on. Um, but there is some genuinely um, chilling stuff in its archives in Austin um, about how pointless all of their operations were. Um, I argue, though, that an essential shift occurred in the Bracero program after 1947, when the process that comes to be known as drying out was inaugurated. Uh, the Mexican government, right, understandably had hoped that the Bracero program would lead to a decrease in unauthorized entries to the United States. Uh, but the lack of stringent border control and the blacklist on Texas, in addition to a series of additional um, issues, combined to do the opposite, right? If, if the Bracero program was meant to sort of channel migration into a kind of legal channel, temporary as it was, um, the reality was it hadn't really done anything, right? It had sort of created this legal channel, but those sort of undocumented channels continue to exist directly alongside. Um, the drying out process was meant to incorporate unauthorized migrants into the Bracero program so that they would enjoy, enjoy the same theoretical protections as Braceros, right? This has begun in 1947, largely at the request of the Mexican government, um, the U.S. government very quickly agrees to sort of start implementing this. For U.S. growers, in particular those in Texas who are still nominally not allowed to contract Braceros, this process allowed them to legitimize their continued violation of the Bracero program's regulations. Um, so this means overnight, suddenly Texas now goes from not legally being able to have any Braceros to having a very large number of them simply through the process of drying out. It's also worth noting the name itself um, is a play on a racial epithet um, about Mexicans. Um, I, I'm not gonna sort of spell that out, but I, I think it's obvious um, what that sort of where that goes. Um, once Texas growers got their hands on the Bracero program, which again begins immediately in 1947, they bent it towards their needs, towards their needs, excuse me. They pushed the US government to seize unilateral control over the program through a series of diplomatic showdowns in the late 1940s and early 1950s at the Texas border. Uh, they helped to short circuit any efforts to enforce the regulations of the program on US soil. Uh, they violated prevailing wage regulations with impunity, certain that nobody would actually punish them. By the early 1950s, they had also, using the leverage of the US government, forced the Mexican government to drop the unilateral, unilateral blacklisting and Texas became, as a result, far and away the largest user of Bracero labor throughout the 1950s. They found that the Bracero program's restrictions on workers' mobility or ability to choose their employers or bargain for better wages neatly replicated their own methods of immobilizing labor. The system lacked the normal brutality of the South Texas model of labor relations, but it came with the express approval of the US government. Texas would remain the primary Bracero user state until the early 1960s, when in the last years of the program, Texas growers largely abandoned it as the Bracero minimum wage rose above the rates they wanted to pay. Um, so it's really kind of remarkable. In 1961, they stopped using and the numbers plummet. So 62, 63, 64, the last three years, um, almost all of the Braceros are going to California. Um, none of them are, are coming to Texas, or a, a minuscule number. Uh, with, the deset, with the death of the Bracero program, Texas growers quietly went back to their old ways of securing labor. In spite of their constant complaints about the program, in other words, the Bracero program had created a close copy of South Texas modes of labor recruitment and treatment, but spread those methods across the country. Ernesto Galarza, one of the loudest voices condemning the Bracero program throughout his life, uh, described Bracero's user's ideal worker as, quote, the man of the barracks, the man in a camp who spent all his time under supervision, if not under surveillance. Outside the barracks, the limits of freedom were prescribed, and they were also the limits of the job. Liberty had found its economic determinant. Um, 
that was, for all intents and purposes, the reality that South Texas growers wanted and helped to create. Um, so I know we're sort of creeping up on, on the sort of 45 minute mark. So I'll go ahead and sort of close here shortly. Um, and, you know, I think the kind of the larger part or the, the kind of where I want to close here um, is the question of why does this history matter? Um, and to sort of get at that, I want to uh, read again, uh, really kind of the last three paragraphs of the book um, in the epilogue where I kind of go into um, the kind of issues at play here. Uh, the solutions that have presented that have been presented for these issues have more often than not just been variations on old schemes that did not work. Calls for beefing up the border patrol and closing the border to uh, undocumented entry are little more than calls for a new Operation Wetback, a 1950s deportation campaign that takes place um, during the, I apologize for using the term, that was the official US government term, um, which solved nothing other than a short-term public relations problem for the INS. Those demands for a closed border are typically made in tandem with calls for a new guest worker program to deal with any future labor shortages, especially but not exclusively in low wage industries like agriculture and food processing. Time and time again, the mechanisms that stripped workers of the ability to claim basic rights in the past are recycled as the only rational response to an immigration system that has supposedly veered out of control. Lost in these discussions is any notion of what border control actually entails and the very serious price borne by workers whose rights are trampled beneath these empty notions. All these incessant empty debates accomplish is tying the taint of illegality more tightly to the most poorly paid workers. The condition of Mexican, Amer Mexican and Mexican American farm workers in South Texas changed little from the beginning of the farm boom in the 19 teens until the post Bracero era. From the beginning of large scale migration from Mexico during the revolution, Mexicans and Mexican Americans were viewed by potential employers as a never ending supply of labor power, more beasts of burden than citizens. This system was merely amplified over the next several decades, even as massive economic and political changes occurred in both nations. Temporary shifts in migration flows, immigration legislation and demographic changes may have altered some of the specifics of these trends, but they have not changed their broad outlines. Migrants have continued to flow from Mexico to South Texas and the rest of the United States while employers have continued to formulate countless methods to put these migrants to work. Migration flows, in fact, have only increased in the years since the end of the Bracero program, with little thought or energy given to improving the treatment meted out to those who migrate. Only rigid enforcement of civil rights and labor laws can improve this situation. Hopefully, the latest wave of nativism, with its red-faced calls for border walls and massive deportations, would recede as all others have. But the disappearance of overt racism is just a beginning. Only when the civil rights of all workers, regardless of citizenship or country of origin, are honored can South Texas, the US-Mexico border region, and the United States as a whole avoid repeating the history of labor repression and racial segregation in South Texas. Um, and I should note, this book came out in October of 2015, um, which means I really stopped writing it um, sometime in 2013, 14. Um, so Donald Trump was just a, you know, you know, loud, pointless, um, uh, failed uh, casino owner at that point. Um, he was not, you know, he just announced his sort of presidency, but we were all largely laughing it off. He certainly was not president yet. Um, in some ways, I, I feel like I, I was almost too cheery in that sort of uh, end point of, of, you know, here's where the future might go since I had no way of knowing Donald Trump was around the corner. Um, but uh, yeah, so I will go in there. Uh, I'm sorry I'm ending with Donald Trump. I know that's a terrible way to try and end a talk that, without making us feel terrible. But um, yeah, so thank you all. And I, I'm happy to sort of um, discuss further any questions you might have. Well, thank you very much, John. You're not, you're not guilty of what happened in, in 2015 and 16. Uh, bueno, eh, voy, eh, Quiero dar lugar a ver si hay preguntas o comentarios para el profesor Weber. Si quieren, hacen la pregunta ustedes directamente o la hacen y, y yo traduzco o como sea. O él también entiende español eh, un poco. So. No sé. No, 
Sí, no, y nada, uh, I do have a couple of questions, uh, John. Uh, bueno, está Pedro. Uh, Pedro. ¿Qué tal? A ver, déjenme ver porque no sé bien usar las reacciones para bajar la mano. Aquí está. Eh, bueno, voy a tratar, escribí la pregunta en, en inglés y voy a tratar de, de hacerla ando medio empolvado en este, en este idioma. My question probably goes beyond the research and the results that you have presented to us, but I'm trying to put it in a broader period. Mm -hmm. Considering that Texas society has a previous experience of racial and ethnic segregation and violence, especially during the 19th century against populations such African-Americans, Mexicans, or Native Americans, mm -hmm. can we trace a continuity from these previous forms of racial segregation and violence, or on the contrary, we are observing a new phenomenon as a result of the modernization processes that took, pl that took place during the beginning of the 20th century in these border regions? Um, so that's a great question. Um, hmm. I, in some ways, I think it's both, right? That, 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 um, older sort of realities of, right, slavery obviously is a kind of central part of the history of Texas. Um, you know, settler colonial violence has its sort of um, residue on, on, on anywhere, right? This, this, the United States is itself built on, um, again, wave after wave of sort of settler colonial violence. Um, so in some ways, yes, I absolutely, I, I think it does, right? There, there's sort of longer continuities that I, that I could have drawn here. Um, I would also argue that there, there is something I think distinct happening here um, that is built not just on sort of racialized violence, um, but is built on, again, this sort of racialized violence. Uh, it's, it's racial capitalism, right? It's, it's this sort of um, an effort to kind of, again, modernize the society um, through the use of, again, building this sort of um, labor system built on a kind of cross-border caste system. Um, And, and in some ways, I, I think those are distinct moments, right? Tr slavery obviously is itself built on notions of, slave, of, 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 of um, racial capitalism. Um, but I, I think the ways in which um, the kind of market, um, modern kind of agriculture, this sort of effort to kind of almost industrialize um, the agricultural system that emerges um, in the early 20th century, I think is a kind of distinct economic model. But you're absolutely right, right? It's, it's built on notions of white supremacy, uh, notions of racial hierarchy um, that obviously echo back, um, that are built in many ways on, on slavery, on, um, you know, the, again, the, the kind of centrality of violence towards Native Americans um, in this region. So in, in some ways, I think it, it's sort of simultaneously both. So I, I don't know if that actually gives you a, <laughs> the answer you sort of wanted, but, you know, I, I, it's a great question. And I, I think one that um, it, it's, it sort of is both of these things simultaneously. Bueno, gracias. Eh, no sé si hay más preguntas. Abraham. Sí, ¿ahí me escuchan? Sí. Sí, good. Eh, bueno, yo no, ok. I just want to, thanks for this talk, eh, John. Hmm? Eh, I've read your book. Eh, it was super eh, useful oh, thank you. On research. Eh, sí, me escuchan bien, solo quiero estar seguro. Sí. Ok. Eh, I want to ask you, like, In the last decade, there has like there's a literature working on how this racial control, like the the attempts of uh, mobility control, like a racial like a racial control has been has worked not only on the U.S. side, but like migration flows come and go on this border. No, mm -hmm. like not only by the U.S. At, and local attempts, but also on the Mexican side. I'm thinking, for example, in Julian's lean porous borders uh, research, mm -hmm. who traces like this, like, uh, and, and others who traces like this mobility of uh, people from like different international racial backgrounds, not only focused on uh, like the Mexican uh, emigration to the US, like mm -hmm. this labor force, but how would you like an after reaction of this literature, how would you see your own research in, in front of this uh, uh, literature. Um, so yeah, so I, I love Julian Lim's book. Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's sort of really great. I'm actually kind of working now on my kind of second book project that deals more specifically with kind of um, migration control sort of issues as the kind of 
um, U.S. kind of gatekeeper status coming together in the 1920s. Um, yeah, so her book came out after mine. So I, I honestly, I, I think I probably would have sort of shifted some things in the way I talk about this had I kind of had access to her work. Because yeah, no, I agree. It's it's um, enormously important. And again, the 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 history of U.S. migration control is one that by the 19 teens and 1920s becomes really fixated on Mexico and Mexicans. Uh, but in, in many ways, again, it, it, it's, it's a much more sort of varied um, kind of history before that, right? Again, so much of um, the early kind of efforts at, 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 you know, kind of keeping out foreigners, right? The sort of the, the need for migration control was focused, again, first on the Chinese, um, the Japanese to a sort of lesser degree. Um, and even then, right, some of that has um, to, to the first question, right, it echoes back to um, mo uh, moments of kind of forced mobility and immobilization of Native American groups. Um, so absolutely, I, I, again, in, in some ways, right, my kind of project was really looking in particular at um, this sort of labor system that comes together. So I was sort of narrowly focused on how Mexico and Mexicans were dealt with by this immigration system. But you're absolutely right. It's, um, as Julian Lim has shown uh, in really sort of elegant fashion, um, there is a much more complicated story there that is largely hidden by the documents, right? That the, the archives have, have sort of um, erased the centrality of um, Asian migrants in particular um, and the communities they built, right? That's what the thing that I find so fascinating about that book is, right, the, the kind of the El Paso Juarez um, communities there, these multiracial communities that are built up um, that, again, are so hard to kind of get a grasp on because they, they um, are often sort of, we, we don't have a lot of documentation about it. Um, so I'm not sure I've entirely answered your question, but no, I agree. I, I, I think her sort of work is, is incredible. And, and I, I'm really sort of um, looking to it as I'm kind of, you know, shaping this sort of second book project. Yeah, please. Yeah, and I just want to have a quick reaction uh, to your own, uh, to something that you just mentioned to Pedro's uh, question, mm -hmm. and it's in, in your own book, uh, which is like uh, thinking, for example, in one of the, like in cotton production, like this industrialized uh, agricultural system. If we see this, the way it shifts from early 20th century until the end of, uh, Bracero program, like the way it was produced changed a lot. And I think Texas is a super, like a particular uh, case of study in like in this regards, especially cotton, because I'm remembering how these uh, attempts to control mobility during Bracero program was kind of seasonal, no? Because like the, oh, like the, como llamas el, bueno, la semilla del algodón, like kind of open in different moments of the week. So like uh, producers needed to have the labor force available in different places at the different time. No? So this mobility kind of uh, was uh, uh, in some way helpful for their own industry, no? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And again, there's, there's sort of moments in, during this sort of period where um, just because of the, the, the vagaries of, of kind of climate, of, of rainfall, you had multiple different sort of areas where the cotton harvest were all beginning at the same time. Usually, right, it would start in the lower valley around um, sort of McAllen and then sort of work its way up. And then a few weeks later, it would be in Corpus. There's one year, I think it was 1924, where for whatever reason, all of it happened at once. And what ends up happening is the growers essentially go to war against each other. Right, to try and make sure that they get the labor and nobody else does. Um, so absolutely, right? It, it's, you know, it, it's sort of part of this sort of system that is both the seasonality that's sort of um, built into kind of agricultural labor, um, but also, again, part of this sort of process of them, right? They need them there when the work begins, right? When the, the, the cotton is ready to be picked, but they don't want them there anymore um, when the labor is done. Yeah, yeah thank you. Gracias, Abraham. ¿Alguien más? No sé si tienen preguntas, comentarios. Paola, Alisa. No. Alejandra, Yuri, Omar. No, por el momento no. 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 Ok. If not, I, I have, a, I have a, couple, a couple of questions. You know, like Abraham or Abraham. 
said. Uh, <laughs> it is it is a really good uh, it is a really good book. You have a really good prose. Uh, and uh, you know, I, I had a couple of reactions from reading those uh, those two chapters that you know we passed around. Uh, and it seems to me that uh, you know the whole system seems to be uh, hypocritical. Uh, in the one hand, you 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 do need uh, a lot of workers, you know, you and and still is in some sense, right? You oh, do sorry. need a lot of a lot of labor, uh, agricultural labor. But on the other hand, you don't you don't you don't want them. Uh, you don't want him there. Uh, so uh, my question will be, do you believe that uh, this system and that Mexican labor ends up uh, subsidizing the US living standards? For example, there are, there are workers who uh, perform a lot of work in lettuce picking or strawberry picking or et cetera. You know, I can go on and on and on cotton picking until the 1960s. 70s. So, do you think that that, that Mexicans end up subsidizing, subsidizing U.S. labor, uh, U.S. living standards? And uh, number two, uh, do you think that uh, modernity is uh, hypocritical in some sense? Um, so, uh, taking that sort of in, in two place parts. Um, so uh, on the one sense, absolutely, yes, right? The, 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 the sort of the first question, um, low wage labor um, sectors are inherently sort of, um, you know, supplementing the entire rest of the economy. Um, you know, there's no sort of question that this has had um, a, a kind of an enormously sort of important um, impact, not only in sort of hollowing out um, kind of elements of, of kind of the working class as, you know, we sort of normally understand them. Um, but again, sort of driving these sorts of cycles. Um, so absolutely, this is, I think, one of the um, unmistakable um, realities of this system, um, that there is a, a, a sense in which um, the continued existence of vast sectors of this economy that are um, by design low wage, right, where the workers have very little capacity to bargain, um, where unionization um, notions have long since been sort of driven out, um, those are massive subsidies um, to the broader sort of population, but in particular, right, to the people who are benefiting directly from that labor, right, whose sort of profits um, are going up, right, the, the kind of the, the management of those companies, the um, stockholders of those companies. Um, and again, the, you know, uh, there are a thousand different examples you could sort of draw from the, the probably the best example in this country right now is um, uh, meatpacking, which for much of the 20th century was one of the most highly unionized sectors in the entire economy. Um, it was right, the unions had a, a sort of foothold, it was a high paying job, right, it was dangerous, right, meatpacking, um, is an incredibly sort of dangerous, dirty job, but it was sort of high paying because the unions were able to kind of get in there and, and, and sort of up the layer, the standard of, of both worker protections and wages. Um, over the last 20 years, it has gone completely the opposite way. Um, the most egregious example being um, the Tyson Corporation, um, right? They, one of the largest chicken producers in the world. Um, they run operations out of Arkansas. Um, and if you look up uh, Steve Striffler's book, Chicken, um, he goes into great detail about the system that they ran throughout the 1990s, um, where they essentially had their own um, uh, migrant um, smuggling scheme uh, from Mexico to northwestern Arkansas, um, and smugglers were paid with Tyson checks. Uh, I mean, it was this remarkably brazen system, uh, because they knew nobody was paying attention. Nobody cared. Um, and again, that is an enormous um, subsidy to the entire rest of the country, right? It, it means that Tyson can sell their horrifying chicken at incredibly low um, rates, you know, driving other businesses out of, you know, other sort of chicken producers out of business because they've set up this um, illegal labor scheme. Um, they eventually get tagged by the U.S. government, but all of it gets thrown out because the people who would have testified against them had already been deported. Um, so it's this, again, it's this sort of grotesque system that kind of feeds on itself. But to your first question, yes, 
Um, and I also think that answers your second question, right? Is this system um, hypocritical? Absolutely, right? Uh, systems of racial capitalism are always built on hypocrisy, um, right? They're built on um, notions of inherent racial hierarchy that are wildly self-serving um, and that are you know, completely undercut um, by the way in which those sort of systems operate, right? So in many ways, the, the economies become dependent on those groups that are supposedly um, the ones who are unemployable otherwise, yet all of the proceeds end up going to um, a very small number, right? I, I guess I'm just also kind of describing the system of capitalism. Um, but, but, you know, essentially this is, right, what um, this system has become, right? In particular, since so much of the Texas system, as I'm, you know, uh, kind of laying it out, was built on race, right? It was, it was sort of built on this notion of inherent racial hierarchy. Um, so yes, right, the hypocrisy is riven through this, right? It's also a democratic society where large numbers of workers have no democratic rights. So, yes. Which is, which is, well, well, see, the thing is that it seems like a contradiction of modernity, but, it, it, you know, as you argue, um, it's built in, into modernity, right? Mm -hmm. So we, we don't frequently see that. And, uh, you know, so that is, that, is, that is why I was, I was asking you. Now, there's a question. There, there was one of our, of our graduate students who, who could not uh, be here because she had the issues of connections, but she sent uh, her questions. I'm going to read them to you. This mm -hmm. question, and these questions are from uh, Ducati. Uh, she's basically saying, can you, she's asking if, can you speak a little bit about the process of reconstruction of the migrations, uh, the changes in urban areas, how they, con they conducted to you, to sources, to trace um, subjects like the levels of segregations that you found. Uh, how, how did you employ these sources, that is to say, uh, with databases, uh, and with maps? Um, so, I, I mean, a lot of the information I'm getting is, is a lot of it's just from US government and Texas state government sources. Um, you know, the, the kind of um, uh, immigration service was constantly sort of tracking this stuff. Um, the Texas State Employment Service and the Department of, of Labor in Washington we're kind of constantly watching this stuff, as was the Department of Agriculture, right? Whose um, task was to sort of go out and make sure that farms continued to operate. So they were always sort of eager um, to try and sort of keep track of what was happening with these sort of migrant streams. Um, a lot of the stuff dealing with more urban issues, uh, a lot of the sources I was working with were um, in particular uh, in the 1920s and 30s, uh, social reform groups really, in particular, got really interested in San Antonio, uh, because San Antonio obviously is one of the kind of central nodes of this migration system, one of the central nodes of the larger kind of South Texas economy. Um, and it is a deeply segregated, um, desperately poor city in many cases, right? The, the, as the kind of Mexican and Mexican-American percentage of the population continue to grow during the early 20th century, all of those people are being packed onto the west side. Um, San Antonio was almost entirely segregated at that moment, right? The north and south sides were white. The east side was largely African-American. The west side was entirely Mexican and Mexican-American. Um, and there was almost no possibility of movement outwards. So by the, the end of the 1920s, the west side of San Antonio was the most densely populated place west of the Mississippi in the United States, right? More densely populated than anywhere in California. It was this astonishingly densely populated place because there was nowhere else to go. Right. People just kept being sort of uh, moved in there. And as the population grew, um, you know, more and more people moved there. So there was an enormous amount of um, reform groups, um, both in the kind of late progressive era, but also into the 20s and in particular in the Great Depression, who were looking at San Antonio as this sort of harbinger of problems that the rest of the country might be facing um, as kind of intense agricultural poverty suddenly now was showing itself in this city. Um, so I think that was one of the kind of sources I use. One of the other sources um, that is enormous, and I know uh, David Montahano for his book used this 
um, a lot was uh, the research notes of Paul Taylor, who is an economist at the University of California in the 20s um, and is one of the first people in the United States to really seriously look at Mexican migration as an academic subject, right? To kind of, and, and again, he, he was an economist, but he was he, much more an ethnographer and anthropologist today. Um, and he essentially went, um, right? He did a couple of studies in Mexico. I know he did, I forget where in Jalisco, I'm blanking right now, Arandas. Arandas. In Arandas. Um, and he did multiple studies throughout um, Dimmit County, uh, Nueces County in Texas. I believe he did one in the Imperial Valley in California. Um, one in like Pennsylvania, Chicago, Colorado. Um, and he went through and he got, um, you know, interviewed a lot of the workers, but he also interviewed a lot of the just other people around um, about, um, you know, what they thought this sort of migration meant. Um, and it's remarkable amount of just detail, right, from just sort of people, right, the, the kind of the Mexican migrants, um, the Anglos who invariably had something astonishingly kind of racist to say about them, um, that it really gives an enormous amount of, if nothing else, kind of uh, depth to a lot of this, right? Beyond just the numbers. Um, it gives us at least a feel for some of what, um, not only the migration trends were, um, but also, right, what they actually meant on a kind of surface, you know, on a kind of grassroots level, right? How the people involved in this um, actually viewed it. Um, so I don't know if there's another part of that that I haven't touched on, um, but yeah, I, I, there's a lot of sources um, to get the voices of the workers can be the most difficult part, right? You, you, there's a lot about the demographics, um, getting at who the workers were and what they felt. Um, Manuel Gamio, <laughs> right? I mentioned him earlier. His, his sort of both the books that he published, but also some of the stuff that's come out later, um, that, that gets a little bit deeper into his kind of research notes that um, Deborah Weber um, put out, um, no relation. Um, she's another Weber who also works on this stuff, but we are not related. Actually, I've never actually met her either, so I really love her work. And she spells um, her last name with a short B, <laughs> right? Um, yeah, so I, I, yeah, so I, I think I've sort of covered it as, as much as I can, but um, yeah, if there's something else that I missed there, please let me know. No, no. I'm trying to remember how she spells her last name. I think it's the same. I don't I know think if she... you her first name is with a short B, Deborah, mm. or something like that. Yeah. Okay. Now, uh, well, uh, I don't. I don't know if there are any other questions. Hay más preguntas, Omar. No. O comentarios. No. Okay. Yeah, so uh, Alejandro. Alejandro. Sí, yo tengo una. Uh, hi, thank you for being here with us. Uh, I read chapter seven, and my question is the following. Uh, could we understand the concept of, of the braceros as a new migratory category product of a um, specific economic and political context? Um, I'm sorry, can you ask that again? Alejandro, otra, otra vez? Uh, yeah, sí. Uh, could we understand the concept of, of the braceros as a new migratory category product of a specific economic and political context? Um, yeah, so, so I, in some ways, I, I think um, one of the ways that I tried to sort of look at this beyond the kind of, right, just, just what was happening with the sort of program during these years um, is, is a kind of broader kind of comparative um, issue. Because I, again, I, I think, the Bracero program is one of a few different, by far the largest, but one of a few different um, guest worker programs the United States undertakes um, during the same moment. There's a, a sort of second smaller one, largely from the Caribbean called the H2 program um, that actually my um, dissertation advisor, um, Cindy Hamovich has written about. Um, and beyond that, right, there's a much broader kind of effort starting in the post-World War II era in a bunch of different countries um, to put these guest worker programs into effect um, that, again, are, are kind of meant to kind of provide temporary labor, uh, but are also in many ways deeply kind of unequal relationships, right? They're binational agreements. Uh, I mean, they've only become more so over the years um, as more and more countries have sort of kept doing this, right? So Western Europe has these 
that they put together right after World War II, right? In part as a kind of rebuilding effort. Um, at the same time, the U.S. is expanding the Bracero program. Um, the U.S. does the H-2 program that, again, largely is sort of bringing a much smaller number of Caribbean workers from Jamaica and the Bahamas. Um, but you also have, right, much of the Middle East economy right now is run through um, similar forms of guest worker programs, right? The, the kind of the United Arab Emirates, um, much of Saudi Arabia's economy, Qatar, um, have these really kind of grotesque guest worker programs that they've set up. And the point of them is, right, as Galarza said in that kind of quote I ended with, right, the point of these systems is to not create a, a group of citizen workers. It's meant to create a set of temporary workers who can be used and then discarded. Um, so I, I think it's an enormously important um, sort of trend, right? The, the Bracero program is the largest example of this we have in US history. And it is, again, deeply problematic in so many ways, right? Beyond the obvious kind of limitations in the enforcement efforts. Um, but no, I, I, I absolutely think this is an enormously important sort of subject matter um, because it's, it, it's only expanded, right? The Bracero program ends in 1964, but this broader set of, of labor agreements um, like the Bracero program that, that you know, then start operating elsewhere in the world are, are an enormously important part of current kind of migratory trends. Um, okay. Yeah. ¿Hay más preguntas o comentarios? No? Okay. Uh, well, uh, we're about the, you know, we're in what, one hour and uh, 17 minutes now. Uh, I, I just want to ask you, uh, John, well, I, I really want to congratulate you again for this for this book. I have it here. I I, I read the uh, I read the epilogue and I don't know. Uh, I don't know if you want to uh, tell us a little bit about the anecdote that you end up. The, well, not the anecdote, because it is not an anecdote, but the mm -hmm. case that you end up the book with. And, the, uh, you know, we'll if there are no more questions or comments, we can end up. Uh, certainly. Um, and I'll also warn you, as I sort of said, right, I, I, I kind of, this book came out six and a half years ago, and I, I pretty much remember what I wrote. <laughs> there's sort of moments where um, there's been a lot that's happened in the last six and a half years. Um, so the, the kind of the epilogue ends, or it begins, I should say, with, um, I, I assume you mean the Hawaiian um, thing. So a group of workers are uh, in South Texas, in Edinburgh, um, are recruited to go work in the pineapple fields in Maui. This is 1991, 1992, um, somewhere in there. I, I'm not going to go scrounging for it. Uh, and they, you know, this seems like a great opportunity. They're promised overtime pay. They're promised, right, given all of these sort of promises that, right, this is going to be a great opportunity. You're going to make thousands of dollars um, so that when you come back to Texas, um, right, this will be, you know, a better sort of paying gig than you would have gotten if you'd sort of remained there. They get shipped to Maui. Um, they immediately find themselves locked into a uh, compound surrounded by razor wire um, that they can't get in or out of. Their past or not their their return tickets have been kept by the employer, actually by the labor contractor who sends them across to the employer. Um, they are sent out into the fields at most for a few hours a day uh, because their labor actually wasn't needed. It turned out. Um, the grower was looking for excess labor. And this labor contractor in South Texas had convinced him that if you get grow workers in South Texas, we can bring them over. Um, they'll work for lower than, you know, what your kind of workers in Hawaii would work for. Um, it's worth noting Hawaii is almost the only state in the United States that has um, unionization in, among its agricultural workers, right? Heavy unionization among agricultural workers, which is partially just the weird right history of Hawaii. Um, but the, you know, so the workers from South Texas get there and get no wages. They're getting no hours. All of the promises they were given are lies. The food they're being given is awful, right? All of the sorts of things that frankly, right, migrant workers from South Texas have always dealt with, right? They're being lied to. They're not getting the wages they um, thought they were going to get. The treatment is sort of horrible. Um, the difference is that one of them was in touch with um, legal aid in the lower Rio Grande Valley. Um, so they get in touch with the Texas Rio Grande legal aid, which still exists. Um, there's still an enormously kind of 
um, important sort of protection for workers um, uh, in the area and just anyone in the area who's being exploited. They do a lot of with trafficking cases and stuff like that. Um, and essentially, you know, called them and said, hey, we're being held here against our will. What can you do to help us? Um, and they end up, as a result, contacting Hawaiian authorities. They end up being let out of their contract um, and flying back to South Texas. Um, and at that point, they end up suing the employer for violation of a series uh, of U.S. laws, both labor and kind of civil rights laws. Um, and end up winning largely because the grow the judge essentially goes to the grower's lawyer and said, look, you're in South Texas. This was being tried in McAllen. Um, if we go before a jury here of people from South Texas and we say you have been exploiting South Texas migrant workers, everyone in this jury is going to know exactly what that means because almost all of them have family who have dealt with this. Um, so you can take your chances of this trial or you can go ahead and pay now because I guarantee you this jury is not going to deal well with this. Um, and so they ended up, you know, uh, paying out, um, you know, trial doesn't go to, doesn't actually go to trial. Um, so it's in one way, I, I think it's this sort of fascinating moment where, right, there's obvious continuities here, right? Um, this looks like the treatment that Mexican American and Mexican agricultural workers have gotten back to the beginning of the study. Um, but it's also odd because, again, they're being shipped to Hawaii, right? This incredibly sort of distant um, area, yet the treatment remains the same, right? They remain in the United States, I understand. Um, but it's also, again, this sort of very strange sort of deal. Um, and in some ways, again, I, I think one of the things this points out is the obvious continuity of the system. Um, as much as changed since the 1960s um, in agricultural law and labor law, um, the reality was in the 1990s, it didn't really look that different any longer. Um, the only difference was the peculiarity of this taking place in Hawaii and not, you know, uh, Corpus Christi. Um, but otherwise, this was the same sort of treatment being meted out to these workers um, because the growers in Hawaii decided they could get away with it in the same way that growers all over the United States always have. Um, okay. And I make a broader argument about the entire economy is now this way, but um, and, I'm not going to I'm not going to drag us right? through that. And outsourcing, it seems like out outsourcing is like a you know like a huge part of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, you know, I felt that you you sort of argued that you know outsourcing began first in in this um, agricultural industries, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, you know outsourcing was everywhere, also in railroad cons construction, etc. But the astonishing part is that, you know, all these continuities that we have even today, right? And, uh, you know, with all these labor practices that where you don't provide any rights uh, for workers and you just use them and discard them as you mm -hmm. like, <laughs> pretty much. Well, Back to the hypocrisy again. Yeah. Well, <laughs> thank you very much, John. Uh, and thank with you. that pessimistic uh, note, con esa nota pesimista, <laughs> We end our talk, right? Oh. Uh, muchas gracias. Thank you very much, John. We really, really appreciate having you here. Omar is going to, uh, Omar va a cortar la transmisión a Facebook. Omar is going to cut out the transmission to Facebook. And if you want to stay, we can, you know, just say thank you. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Bueno, David, antes de cortemos, eh, hacer la invitación para el próximo jueves 7 de abril, a las 12 horas, que estará con nosotros la doctora Diana Méndez y el doctor Víctor Groel presentando el libro Mensajes desde la frontera México-Estados Unidos reflexiones históricas sobre el turismo y la cultura nacional. Entonces para que estén atentos en las redes sociales y los correos eh, los vamos a invitar para el próximo el próximo jueves 7 de abril. Entonces pues, pues muchas gracias y cortamos. Bueno.